Hello everyone and welcome to the second part of our lecture concerning the pulmonary response to exercise. In our first video we talked about how we move air in and out of our lungs and we determined that the respiratory muscles are going to help change the volume of our lungs which will help change the pressure inside and when the pressure of the alveoli becomes less than the atmosphere we will inhale air and then when the pressure on the inside becomes greater than the atmosphere, that's when we're going to exhale air. And so we talked about different lung volumes and lung capacities, um, what is considered normal and what is the maximum amount of air that we could take in or we can exhale. But today we're going to talk more about the blood gases, right? So the reason that we're, that we're taking in all this air is because we need to take in O. Two, so that O2 can be utilized by the cells and tissues of our bodies. And the reason that we have to exhale the air is to not only get ready for the next inhale, but we also need to get rid of that CO2 that's been uh, accumulated because of metabolism. So we'll talk more about the, uh, the laws and the mechanics of that today. Uh, but on this slide, you can see an artist's rendition of what is going on at the pulmonary circulation. So here we have a capillary, a pulmonary capillary, and these red blood cells are going to squeeze through um, and come into contact, or close contact anyway, with the alveoli. And when that deoxygenated blood makes its way to the alveoli, we're going to have O2 diffused through these membranes. So the uh, membrane of the alveoli and the membrane of the capillary, and that O2 will bind to red blood cells. And then also the CO2 that we were carrying throughout the bloodstream, some of that will also be diffused to the alveoli for us to exhale. Now, the movement of these gases is dependent upon the differences in their partial pressures. So when we look at the alveoli, this is going to be the region of our cardiopulmonary system that has the highest partial pressure of oxygen. And so here in this diagram, they're saying that the partial pressure of oxygen in the uppercase A, alveoli, is 100 mmHg or 100 tor. And so when that non-oxygenated blood or that deoxygenated venous blood makes its way from the right ventricle to the alveoli, we're going to have a difference or a gradient in those pressures. And so we have 100 here for o partial pressure of O2 and, and 40 here for the partial pressure within the venous blood. And so that's going to mean that oxygen is going to move or diffuse from this alveoli to the capillary. And so when we look, you know, after the blood leaves that capillary and starts making its way back to the heart, we are going to have a higher O2, partial O2 pressure within that oxygenated blood. And that's because we have this pressure gradient so oxygen can diffuse. The same thing goes for CO2. It's going to move from a higher partial pressure to a lower partial pressure. And that's how we're able to exhale out some of that CO2. But in addition to a pressure gradient, there are other things that determine how much uh, blood gases are diffused. And so there are a few things you need to look out for, for as far as diffusion is concerned or how much diffusion is going to take place. Uh, number one is going to be the area of diffusion, right? And so this is all part of fixed law of diffusion. And so um, one you know thing that's going to impact is how much space, how much area do you have to have diffusion? The more alveolar um, area that you have, the more potential you have for diffusion to take place. So the bigger the lungs, the bigger the alveolar space, the more area, the more O2 and CO2 that can be diffused. And so you may ask, well, why would this change at any point? Well, one, you know, it's going to vary based on your size. But two, if you think about the negative health outcomes that... Um, are present in those with poor behavioral lifestyle choices, like smoking, for example. Well, with smoking, you're going to have destruction to some of those areas of the 
um, of the lungs. And so you're going to have alveolar damage, and therefore that's going to mean you have less area for oxygen to diffuse. And that's going to have negative outcomes, not only with the amount um, of oxygen within your lungs, but the amount of oxygen that can then diffuse into the blood. So first thing that determines uh, diffusion is going to be area of the alveoli. Number two is going to be the thickness of those walls. So the thicker the wall, the harder it is for that gas to diffuse. And that's why, again, we want to try to prevent people or stop people from smoking uh, because one of the outcomes of that is that you have an increase in alveolar wall thickness. You get more fibrotic um, alveolar tissue, and then you also have mucus buildup uh, around the lungs because of that increased inflammation, and that makes it harder, again, for oxygen to diffuse. And then third, the you know what's going to dictate that diffusion, again, is going to be pressure gradient, which is pressure one minus pressure two. The bigger gradient that you have, the more blood gas that will diffuse. And so oxygen, as we know, does not diffuse as easily into the blood as carbon dioxide. And so that's why when the O2 is being transported from the lungs, from the alveoli, to the bloodstream, it needs to bind itself to red blood cells, right? So here we see a microscopic view um, of our alveolar tissue, this you know clear empty space here, and then we see all the blood capillaries um, that are going to surround these alveoli, right? And here, these little dots you see, those are red blood cells that are actually coming into contact with the alveoli. And the more red blood cells and the more surface area you have, uh, between the capillaries and the alveolar space, the more diffusion you're going to get. And therefore, you can uh, increase the amount of arterial oxygen content. All right, so here we see a graph to the right, and this down below is going to be the time in the capillary. So how much time is that red blood cell going to spend in contact with the alveoli? And here we have the partial pressure of O2. And so we know that, you know, after we use the oxygen um, from the blood, that we call that blood now is deoxygenated. And so, um, you know, we also have a name for that called mixed venous blood, right? So this venous blood is going to have a lower O2 content, as you could see right here at around 40 mmHg than the arterial blood because we've used some of that oxygen. Some of that oxygen has been diffused from the blood to the cells. And so when the mixed venous blood makes its way back to the vena cava, back to the heart, and it gets pumped to the lungs, well, that pressure at the lungs is going to be significantly higher at 100 mmHg, right? So that alveolar PO2 is much greater than the mixed venous PO2, and that's how we get diffusion from the lungs to the blood. And so at rest, that VO2, what we're actually you know, using, is going to be determined by blood flow. How much blood can we get to the lungs? Um, but, you know, as you are exercising... Blood is going to be pumped out at a quicker rate, and more of it is going to be circulated, you know, because we're increasing our cardiac output. So the time, right, that that red blood cell, while at rest, it may get a, you know, a full 0.75 seconds or a full second to make contact with the uh, alveolar cells, right? But during exercise, that time span is going to be reduced a little bit. Right? So here we see that reduced contact time, and when we're looking at the oxygen content of the blood, it will reduce our PO2 just by a little bit. Now, not to a great degree, and we do make up for it with the increased cardiac output and the increased metabolism. But again, because of that decrease in time that the uh, red blood cells are spending in contact with the alveoli, it can partially reduce uh, the oxygen content of the blood. And that's why in elite athletes, the VO2 is par partially uh, diffusion limited um, because they are pumping out large quantities of blood flow. 
right? And so that's not the thing that's really restricting VO2. What's restricting VO2 uh, partially is that is that time spent in the alveoli. So this can partially, again, it's not like a major thing, but it can affect the O2 content of the blood when those uh, red blood cells do not spend as much time in contact with alveolar PO2. But, um, you know, what you have is that when we then, you know, pass that blood from the venous circulation to the lungs, well then when we look at the arterial O2 content, it's going to be very, very similar in a healthy person to the alveolar O2 content. And so a lot of times you'll see alveolar partial pressure of O2 is going to be roughly around 100, and then the arterial uh, partial pressure of O2 is going to be normally around 100 because it reaches sort of an equilibrium, and then that oxygenated blood can pass through the rest of the body. And so with VO2 max, how does blood... Uh, how does the blood transport oxygen to the working muscles? And so our VO2 max is around 3.5 liters per minute on average, and our cardiac output max is around 25 liters per minute. So if you do the math, that means each liter of blood must unload 140 milliliters of O2 per minute. But not all of the O2 is unloaded from the blood. If you took the O2 content of venous blood, you are going to have some oxygen in it. So even though we call it deoxygenated blood, there's still a small pressure of O2 there. But the important thing is going to be to maintain the partial pressure of O2 in the blood. So we have that big pressure gradient between the arterial blood um, and the cells. So again, it's that pressure gradient that's most important. If you could oxygenate the arterial blood more, if you can, you know, start with a high starting point of oxygen, and then you have a lot of metabolism, so a low amount of partial pressure at the cells, that's going to mean you're going to have a lot of diffusion between the arterial blood and to the cell, and so that's going to increase the driving pressure from the red blood cell to the mitochondria. So we increase that diffusion two ways. One, by getting more oxygen into the blood, and then two, to lower the second pressure, we metabolize more oxygen. We utilize more of that oxygen at the site of the cell, so that keeps the driving pressure high. And that will increase as exercise intensity increases. So here we see the oxygen, uh, sorry, the hemoglobin disassociation curve. Um, you've seen it before, but basically the amount or percentage of hemoglobin that are bound to oxygen is going to be dependent on the pressure of O2. So here, as we see, um, the partial pressure of O2 of 100, which is going to be, you know, what it should be at the lungs, we're going to see 95% or above of hemoglobin saturation, right? And so um, now, you know, I, I won't have you, re you know, I won't require you to know all this math off the top of your head, uh, but basically we transport oxygen through red blood cells. The amount of actual dissolved O2 here in the blood plasma is very, very, very limited we carry 99% of our O2 through hemoglobin. So if we want to increase arterial O2 content, we need to increase the concentration of hemoglobin, right? So that's going to ensure that the blood is able to carry more oxygen. That's going to be the major factor. It's about the concentration or the amount of red blood cells that you have within your blood. The more red blood cells that you could carry, uh, the more oxygen you're going to be able to carry. And so maximum O2 that can combine with hemoglobin is called your O2 carrying capacity. And so, again, the math isn't necessarily critical, uh, but working it out, one gram of hemoglobin combines with 1.34 uh, milliliters of oxygen, and so average hemoglobin um, is around 15 grams, per deciliter of blood. So therefore, when you do the math, your average carrying capacity is around 20.85 milliliters of O2 per deciliter of blood. Uh, this can change if 
you know, based on gender. Um, you guys have probably discussed the female athlete triad before. Um, so maybe lower in females and actually in trained athletes as well. Um, but again, that's probably a discussion for another video. Um, but you calculate the O2 carrying capacity by, again, the level of hemoglobin. So this is going to be the probably one of the most important factors when it comes to how much oxygen can be transported through the blood. That's going to rely on how much hemoglobin is within the blood stream. And so, of course, it's not the only thing that comes into consideration when you're discussing the O2 content of the blood. But when you look at things like alveolar O2 partial pressure and the percentage of hemoglobin bound to um, oxygen, this provides a very limited information on the content of the blood. And one example that we could prove that, hey, it's really more so about the amount of hemoglobin you have than compared to the percentage of them that are bound or or the um, level of oxygen in the lungs, is anemia, right? And so anemia is a um, disorder where there isn't as much production of iron. And we know that red blood cells, the way that they are able to carry oxygen is because they have these heme groups, right? So if you don't have that ability, um, you know, if you have low iron count and you're not able to, you know, produce those heme groups, um, you know, you're going to have a lower O2 content in your blood. But, but anemia, you know, doesn't... Oh, let me change this here because that's wrong. But anemia doesn't affect the amount of oxygen coming into the alveoli, nor does it affect the relative percentage of O2 bound to hemoglobin. What anemia does impact is again the concentration of hemoglobin. So not how much is being diffused, not the percentage, but how much total content there is. So there is a reduction in O2 content, not because of, of alveolar partial pressure or the actual relative percentage, but the content is going to be reduced through the amount of hemoglobin concentration that there is, right? So. You can calculate O2 content, and you need to use the saturation of O2. You need to, um, you know, take into consideration the amount of alveolar PO2. But overall, the thing that's going to determine the amount or the carrying capacity of your blood is going to be that concentration of hemoglobin. Um, so, you know, you could work uh, these out here on your own, but you could calculate O2 content based on these different factors. So if you have the alveolar O2 concentration, if you have the saturation of oxygen, and again, that most important factor here, the concentration of hemoglobin, you're able to calculate how much oxygen we're able to move per liter of blood. And so there are things that also impact the transport of oxygen within our bloodstream. And that's other factors that include acidity or pH, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, temperature, and a byproduct of glycolysis called biphosphoglycerate or BPG. And so here we see the normal um, O2 disassociation curve. But when we have changes in CO2 and pH in BPG in temperature, it is going to impact this disassociation curve. Uh, so we'll focus on CO2 first, and then we'll sort of relate that to exercise because we're going to experience during exercise what is called the Bohr shift, right? So if I talk about CO2, which is a byproduct of metabolism, well, if I am working out and I'm having more skeletal muscle contractions and I'm burning through more energy and I'm going to have a higher production of CO2. And so since the content of CO2 is going up, when that blood passes, when that blood passes through to the systemic capillaries, to the site of my muscle tissue, that increase in CO2 is actually going to shift 
this dissociation curve downward, meaning that at the site of the muscle cells, because there is more CO2, that is going to kick off more of the oxygen from the red blood cell, and then that CO2 is going to enter the bloodstream, which is a good thing when you think about it. Because during exercise, we want to dump off more O2 at the muscle tissues. So if we're driving up that CO2 content, it's going to kick off more oxygen from the red blood cells, and that's going to be able you know, to help increase metabolism during physical activity. Right? So that CO2, when that increases, it's going to kick off more O2, therefore disassociating more O2 at the site of the cells, which again, positive thing. Um, the same thing is true for the hydrogen content. Again, these hydrogen ions. Um, so this is the tricky part, again, about pH, is that um, pH is a log equation. So when hydrogen content goes up, when hydrogen ions go up, acidity goes up, but pH goes down. But again, a byproduct of metabolism is that we're going to have more of those hydrogen ions. Uh, so when that pH at the cells goes from 7.4, which is at normally, and during exercise, the acidity of the blood, especially within that region, can decrease. Well, that increase in acidity is going to lead to more oxygen dump off. Right, And the same thing is true with temperature as well. Uh, think about exercise. Of course, your internal core temperature is going to rise because you are breaking down more energy and releasing that en some of that energy as heat. So also, as temperature increases, we get more O2 dump off as well. So basically, going back to this last page, when you get an increase in acidity, or decrease in pH, when you get a higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide, when you get a higher temperature, and then, I didn't discuss this one, but again, this is a byproduct of glycolysis, biphosphoglycerate. And so during exercise, those all of the metabolic pathways are going to increase. And so when you get an increase in BPG, that's also going to lead to um, a more disassociation of O2 from the red blood cells. So an increase in all of these things is going to lead to more oxygen getting dumped off from that red blood cell, from the arterial blood, uh, to the mitochondria of those working muscle cells. And again, that's a good thing. That's what we want. We want to utilize more oxygen during exercise. Uh, just a note here that the binding, so affinity, the strength of binding of carbon monoxide is um, way, way, way greater, right? About 240 times greater to hemoglobin than O2. And so that's why you are always on the lookout for um, carbon monoxide poisoning. So um, that's sort of the mechanism behind that is that since these carbon monoxides are going to have such, such a strong binding uh, to the red blood cells, they're not going to let go. And so then that's going to, um, you know, basically blunt the ability of oxygen to bind. And that's why you get carbon monoxide poisoning. All right, so that is O2 travel. We need to keep pressure gradients high. We need to make sure there's a um, amount of hemoglobin in the blood to carry more oxygen, and that things like CO2 and pH and biphosphoglycerate and temperature can all impact how much oxygen is diffused from the blood. But let's go into a little bit more about CO2, because CO2 and its transport is going to be important as well. We don't want CO2 levels to start to accumulate, so we need to make sure that we can diffuse CO2 into the bloodstream and then diffuse it out into the lungs so we can exhale it. So at VO2 max, the VCO2 is approximately the same as VO2. And so that means that we are producing a lot of carbon dioxide, especially when we exercise, right? So the more that we, um, the more skeletal muscle contractions we have, the more CO2 that will be accumulated, and we need to get rid of that VCO2. And so when you relate these two, you get something called your respiratory exchange ratio, which is your VCO2 over your VO2, and then it's around one, but really greater 
than one for certain reasons, um, including lactate, metabolism, at maximal exercise. So if you're not at that steady state, just like I said, that VCO2, the amount of CO2 that you produce, is going to uh, go up. And so the red blood cell must also load one, uh, 14 milliliters of CO2 to eliminate at the pulmonary capillary. So we're taking in roughly 14 milliliters of CO2 per deciliter, and then we're getting rid of that same amount because we're trying to keep a balance within the body. Um, but the difference is that red blood cells can be dissolved in the actual blood plasma itself. And we're going to talk about all the ways that we do transport CO2. But again, it's important to get out that CO2. We want to get rid of it. Um, so it's going to be traveled throughout our bloodstream um, in order to get rid of it. And so here is how we get rid of CO2, or sorry, how it's transported um, through the blood. And so 7% is actually dissolved in the plasma. And then we have 23%, uh, which is going to attach itself um, to the different proteins within our blood, particularly the red blood cells. So some of that carbon dioxide um, will attach itself to red blood cells as well. But most of the way that we carry our carbon dioxide through our bloodstream is called bicarbonate. And so bicarbonate is created um, through a, an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. And so what you're going to have as a byproduct of metabolism is some CO2, and then you also, through the electron transport chain, get the um, production of metabolic water. And so in order for this CO2 to be transported throughout the bloodstream, and in order not to raise CO2 levels too high, what we do is we are going to combine this CO2 and this H2O in carbonic anhydrase in that enzyme to create first something called carbonic acid. And so CO2 plus H2O makes carbonic acid. And then this hydrogen ion is going to be kicked off from carbonic acid to make this end product here called bicarbonate. And so again, that takes place um, through the enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, and that's located within the red blood cell. So just skipping ahead, we see that you know the CO2 that is made in the systemic tissue, uh, some of it is dissolved within the bloodstream, but then some of it is going to be uptaken by the red blood cell. Some of that CO2 will just combine um, you know, to hemoglobin, but then, again, here we see that reaction that we just talked about and how most of our CO2 is going to be transported. So CO2 combines with water in carbonic anhydrase, produces that carbonic acid. Uh, the hydrogen proton uh, will stay in the red blood cell while the bicarbonate goes back out into the blood plasma and then gets transported back to the lungs. And so... You know, this bicarbonate diffuses out of the red blood cell, but again, the hydrogen cannot. And the thing is that, you know, we have to be very careful when it comes to physiology and introducing charges, right? So charges of different elements. So hydrogen comes along with that positive charge. And we know that pH can really disrupt some of our physiological processes and the uh, binding or in our protein structures, right? So in order to make sure that we don't have... Um, too much addition of positive charges, we need to balance that out with negative charges. And so we have then, since that um, hydrogen is going to stay bound to the red blood cell as we transport carbon dioxide to the lungs, we're also going to have a diffusion of chloride to match that positive charge with a negative charge. And that's called the chloride shift. Um, and so you know, again, when we increase that amount of hydrogen that is being produced, um, that's going to kick off some of that O2. And so that's going to help unload some of that O2 from the blood, um, and that O2 will be diffused through the tissues. And so here we see a diagram of this again, so that carbon dioxide will combine with water, um, eventually make bicarbonate hydrogen, uh, that bicarbonate is going to 
um, go into the bloodstream, hydrogen will stay along, and then there will be a chloride shift in order to balance out the charges. And then what's going to happen is when we make our way back to the lungs, right, that bicarbonate that is being transported here to our uh, pulmonary circulation, it's got to make its way back to CO2. Uh, but luckily, going back here, that this enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, as you can see um, by the chemical equation here, not only does it take this reaction in the forward direction, um, making bicarbonate from CO2 and H2O, but it also, the same enzyme, will take this in the reverse order as well. So from, um, from bicarbonate and hydrogen, we're going to have that bicarbonate go back into the red blood cell. It will make uh, carbonic acid and then separate back into CO2 and H2O. And that CO2 and H2O, that's what we exhale. That's what we breathe out. And then the process can begin all over again with oxygenating the blood, transporting it out to the tissues, um, O2 gets dropped off, CO2 gets picked up by the blood, we you know, convert some of that CO2 to bicarbonate, and then when we make our way back to the alveoli, that CO2, that H2O is released. So that's pretty much it uh, for this lecture. So we talked about a lot here today. We talked about uh, what maximizes the diffusion of blood gases. We talked about how you can carry more O2, and that's going to be through increased hemoglobin uh, concentration. We talked about O2 dump off and the things that can uh, increase or decrease O2 dump off, including CO2, pH, uh, temperature, and biphosphoglycerate. And then we talked about the transport of carbon dioxide as well. Uh, so in our next lecture, we're actually going to talk about a cool topic. We're going to talk about altitude and the changes that our body must take in order to adapt to altitude. And we'll try to come at it, too, from a athletic perspective um, and see, you know, some of the recommendations in the past about training high or sleeping low. You know, what is the basis behind those recommendations? Thank you guys so much, and I will see you next lecture.